O oh God, from all eternity to all eternity future, you are solid, reliable, trustworthy, good. We thank you, O oh God, that your words are like you are, trustworthy, reliable, pure. Lord, we are mere humans and tainted at that. Our words are not like yours. We dare not even trust ourselves. We pray that our words would conform to yours, that we would think your thoughts after you, that we would be like you in conduct and in speech. And we pray as we look to your word this night, that it would have the effect that you promised. It would make wise the simple. And that it would teach us. That we would see in your law wonderful things that the result would be our greater conformity to you. We thank you for the anchor and the bedrock that are your truths. We lean on them. We need them. Even this night, help us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 12, the next in the songbook of Israel for us to study together. These psalms are rather remarkable. They are fixed like all of God's word. Forever God's word is settled in heaven. It never changes. And yet these psalms have changing significance for us as we walk through life's various situations. The meaning is the same as it's always been, and yet the significance for us is changing. Just as we sung these two songs... Uh, These were human songs that we just sung, though reflecting on biblical truth. Uh, Chris and I were were talking about the the nature of of a song written by a human author, and he meant something when he wrote it. He felt something when he sang it the first time, and, and we all sing it, and it tends to have different angles of flavors of significance for us as we go through things. The two songs we just sang were very familiar. I didn't have to look at the slides to know the words, and yet they felt like new songs to me this week. And Chris said, you sing them into a moment, and the truth rings out. Uh, There's something true about the songs we sing to one another, the truths we sing to one another. And it is even more true of God's word, which is inerrant, infallible, reliable, Always true, never wavering in what it meant. It will always mean what it meant when God wrote it. And yet for us, truths hit home as these songs intersect with experience. We read Psalm 12 this evening. Follow along as I read the text. For the choir director, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Yahweh. For the holy man ceases to be. For the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak worthlessness to one another. With a flattering lip and with a double heart they speak. May Yahweh cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Yahweh. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. You, O Yahweh, will keep them. You will guard them from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side. When vileness is exalted among the sons of men. The ascription at the top of the psalm is part of the text. And it reads, for the choir director, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Again, for the choir director just means God ordained that we would sing these things. These songs made the book. And these songs are sung by the people of God as they face different situations than the songwriter originally faced when he wrote it. And this was God's design. We would sing truth to one another, even truth that reflects the experience of lament and difficulty, prayer and request, and theological truth. 
This is for the choir director to direct God's people to sing together. And it is to be sung on the 8th. The, the word sheminith here either refers to maybe an eight-stringed instrument or some sort of uh, tune related to eight stanzas or something having to do with eight. Maybe a tune sung on the octave uh, involving eight notes. Uh, we're not quite sure. And this is a song of David. We're not told the background, the specific historical background, uh, though we do have the narrative of David's life, and, and we can begin to sort of guess at superimposing the sentiments of this song onto some of the situations in his life. We can understand that David wrote songs like this from his own experience. The experience that David feels here is the experience of a culture of corruption. Corruption expressed particularly in speech. He was living in a time where the treachery of deception surrounded him. And so we have in this song six observations of a man troubled by corruption. Six observations of a man troubled by corruption. I've titled this song simply, Help. It comes from the first word in the English text, save or deliver, O Yahweh. And the word is to expand the help for me. It is a, a request for help. To, to save or to deliver reflects this, first of all, distressing circumstance that David is in. The first observation of a man troubled by the corruption around him is just that his circumstances are distressing. And so he cries out for help. Save, O Yahweh, he says, deliver. By the way, that request, help, is always a timely prayer. It is the fundamental language of prayer. It is the recognition that I'm a creature, God is creator, and I need him every hour. To cry out for help when things are going swimmingly is appropriate. And to cry out for help in times of adversity is appropriate. And the psalmist does that here. And he does so in the midst of a prevailing culture of lies, untruths, deceptions, and unreliable characters. We'll see that as this psalm unfolds. Notice what he says in verse 1. The holy man ceases to be, the faithful disappear from among the sons of men, and they, that is the, the remaining culture, speak worthlessness, each man to his friend. With a flattering lip or with smooth speech and to a heart and to a heart, that is, with a double heart, they speak. This is a culture of words used poorly, words used as weapons. Do you ever feel alone at work? Perhaps like you're the only one abiding by the rules. You're the, you're the only one doing what's supposed to be done. You're, you're the only one with integrity and everybody else is cutting corners. You, you might ask, how can I succeed if I'm the only one playing by the rules? Maybe you're a student at school and you feel alone similarly. Everybody else is looking off of somebody else's paper. Term papers are written by chat GPT, and, and you're slaving away at home, sweating over the next right word to put down on paper. How can you get along if you can't compete the way others do? I have known some professional athletes trying to play by the rules who wondered, is there anybody in baseball not juicing? There was an era where if you were a professional cyclist on tour, you knew the real deal. The competition at the highest end of competition was about who could cut the corners and get away with it. Everybody was doing it. This is the perception that David has as the backdrop of this song. Notice in verse 1, the holy man ceases to be. Uh, the holy man here is, is a word for one who is kind, one who is characterized by covenant love. It's built on the very famous word in the Bible for loving kindness. Really, it's unfortunate it's translated here as holy. It should be something like the holy kindness type guy. That's the idea. One whose life is characterized by the loving kindness of the Lord flowing out in relationship to others. That man ceases to be. And then David laments that the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. This word for faithful is a word that's used for foundational pillars in architecture. They are the reliable ones, the trustworthy ones, the, the ones on whom society would depend. 
Listen, if a man isn't good for his word, all the culture falls apart. Are the kind and the trustworthy gone from the land altogether? Are there no more people characterized by love for God and love for others in the covenant community? Are the godly extinct in the land? Francois Legois was a French Protestant in the 1600s. Tough time to be a French Protestant. He was forced to leave his homeland in 1685 when Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of, Edict of Nantes was a, a, a tolerance move from the government that allowed Protestants in France not to be killed and not to have their stuff taken away all the time. When Louis XIV revoked that protection, the French Calvinists were in trouble. Uh, they're called the Huguenots. And when that protection was revoked, it was open season on the Huguenots. They were viciously betrayed by their own countrymen. As at other times of persecution, the government came along and said, look, you can have their stuff if you just turn them in as Protestants. You rat out a Protestant, you get their grand piano or whatever the stuff you wanted they had. So they were betrayed by their own countrymen, exiled from their own lands. Most, were not able to, the mo most who were not able to flee France were killed in France. And French Protestantism became nearly extinct. Francois Legois was in his 50s. When he fled France, he was immediately impoverished because Protestants who would not revert to Catholicism or Protestants who would flee the country were forced to forfeit all of their belongings, all of their property, all of their monies. And impoverished and old, he decided to try to establish a Huguenot colony on a remote island in the Indian Ocean. He was a merchant and a traveler and decided to start over on a barren rock, an uninhabited island. He and his Protestant friends built huts on this uninhabited island in the Indian Ocean. They, they found an island that had plenty of food, plenty of water, but it was isolated. They, they could have lived there just fine on their own. But think about what it would be like to have half a dozen French Huguenots, Protestants, who loved the gospel with no one to take the gospel to. They got bored. They only lasted two years. But he wrote detailed journals describing the wildlife on the island, wildlife that was unique to that set of islands, including a flightless bird that was twice the size of a goose that was easy to catch and really good to eat. Of course, his journals went public. They found their way to Europe. It wasn't long before merchants, pirates, and soldiers found the islands and shot all the birds for sport, leaving their carcasses dead on the ground. Quickly brought the birds to extinction. The dodo. In short order, the Huguenots in France and the dodo birds in the islands were gone. Now, Scott Demarest, who is sitting here this evening, is of Huguenot descent. So we can confidently assert that the Huguenots are not extinct in this world. Thank you, Scott. The dodo, however, is forever gone, at least in this age. David's concern in this psalm is that the godly are all gone. Are they all extinct? Are, are, are the pillars gone? Godliness has been replaced by a culture of treachery. And David here in this psalm is not describing far off lands. David is not lamenting the moral downgrade of the Assyrians, nor the corruptions of the Amalekites, nor the treacheries of the indigenous peoples of Polynesia. David is lamenting the corruption of his own people, the covenant people of God who had the law of God in the land of Israel. And there seems to David to be no more truth, no longer any reliable people. Now, were there absolutely zero godly people left? No, as the psalm unfolds, we will see that there are godly ones, but they are oppressed, afflicted, and in need. In any season, in any era, in any location, the decline of faithful pillars of covenant kindness should provoke the godly to prayer. And that is why this psalm is in the songbook. So that generations past David, when they feel these very same things, godly men just went home to be with the Lord. Godly women have gone to their eternal home. Some leaders have fallen. We need to pray. We need to pray that God would raise up more faithful ones. 
And notice in verse 2 where their corruption is felt so poignantly by David in their speech. He sings, they speak worthlessness to one another. With flattering lip and a double heart they speak. Speech is a remarkable gift. In the opening pages of our Bible in Genesis chapter 2, you have conversations between the maker and the maid. Conversations between God the creator and those humans he made in his own image. God gave directives. God provided to Adam a helper. Adam sings the first love song. It was in the cool of the day that God walked through the garden with Adam and Eve. And all of those conversations were pure and sinless and right and true. That was before the fall. Of course, the fall of man affects speech. Speech is a a wonderful gift designed by God for the glory of God in doxological praise and the building up of humanity by truth. Listen to the way speech is supposed to work in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4.15 says, We are to speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom, from whom the whole body, being joined and held together by every joint of supply, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Speech has been redeemed and designed by God and the church with believers to build up, to edify, to be constructive. Listen to the effects of speech gone wrong in James. James 3 verse 5 describes the tongue as a small part of the body boasting of great things. He's picking up on the language of Psalm 12. Behold how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body, sets on fire the course of our existence, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast and bird, reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, blessing and cursing my brothers, these things ought not be. And all of us know painfully how easy it is for that corruption to emerge from our own lips, from our own tongues, the tearing down of others, designed by God to build up, designed by God to bless Him and our fellow man. David laments this curse on the lips. They speak worthlessness to one another, emptiness. Literally, each man to his friend. And then he says, they are guilty of flattery. Literally, in in Hebrew, this is smooth speech. The kind of speech that is designed to convince with dishonest niceties. He says they are double-hearted. Two hearts. That is a way to talk of double speak, to say one thing and yet mean another. It is divided. One thing on the outside, another on the in. Charles Spurgeon said of this verse, it is better to live among lions than liars. This kind of treachery is something David felt acutely. He had experienced treachery like this. He had been betrayed by a man named Doeg, the Edomite. You may remember that Doeg's conspiracy and treachery led to his murder of the priests at Nob in 1 Samuel 21 and 22. David had been there and then had left and then all the priests were killed because David had been there. We don't know the specific backdrop of Psalm 12, but we do know that David could speak from experience. He had been betrayed by the treachery of evil speech and evil conduct. And here in this psalm, he seems to feel the whole world has gone unfaithful. There's a second observation he makes in verses 3 and 4. It is the observation of a certain outcome for the wicked. Verse 3 begins, May Yahweh... 
in the Legacy Standard English translation. I believe it should be translated, Yahweh will cause to be cut off all flattering lips. Yahweh will cut off the flattery and the double speak, the smooth talk and the boastful tongues. I believe this is a, a promise. This is an expectation of, of a certain outcome that Yahweh will bring about. And notice in this verse that flattery and boasting are nearly equated. And I hope you can see why. Boasting is a kind of flattery of self. And flattery is the boasting of others for the benefit of self. Both of those are self-focused. And they don't deal in true words but in the kind of sycophancy, the, uh, the kind of buttering up words that feel smooth but have an agenda. As King David would have experienced that sycophancy of people trying to curry favor with him, to flatter him, to get what they wanted. You may remember that men would run up to King David or the soon-to-be King David to be the bearers of the good news. The good news that Saul was dead or another of David's enemies were dead. They were hoping to get favor with the new king to have a place of honor or maybe a monetary reward or some power or prestige. They didn't know David's heart that David actually honored Saul. Though Saul had made himself David's enemy, David saw Saul, saw Saul as the anointed king placed by Yahweh and David himself would not displace him. And so these people attempting by flattery to win favor with David actually lost their lives for their dishonesty. David would also suffer under those who tried to win favor with David's enemies by similar treachery. So David here expresses confidence that God will take care of all of these things in the end. God will cut off all such deceptive speech and destructive words. Notice in verse 4 how these evil talkers are described. They have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Uh, this is arrogance in power. They are confident they can do whatever they want with their tongues and that they will succeed. They say, they're, our lips are our own. Nobody's in charge. No one is Lord over us. They assume they are immune from accountability for their speech and conduct. They are free to get away with whatever they try. They have authority, position, and power enough to do what they want with an assumed impunity. The trouble for them is they actually do have a Lord, despite what they say. What is their Lord? Who is their Lord? First of all, their own appetites. They are governed by their appetites. They are also slaves of their own sin. And they, of course, are under the tyranny of the God of this world. Ultimately, they are under the sovereign hand of the Lord of all lords who will hold them accountable. The unbelievers surrounding David, who acted with speech in contempt of him and oppressed others who trusted the Lord, will have to face the Lord for every careless word, for all that they've said and done. And the question for us is simply, how long will Yahweh tolerate their boasts? And, and only Yahweh knows that. But the end is certain, and David affirms that here. Can you imagine for a moment the fulfillment of this confidence? And, and if you, even if you were to take this as a prayer, Yahweh, please cut off all the flattering lips and smooth speech and boastful tongues. There will be an answer. There will be a fulfillment of this. Can you imagine the kingdom of Christ when Messiah reigns on the earth, when he rules the nations with a rod of iron, Psalm 2? What will it be like when truth prevails rather than untruth? We live in a culture in our day where untruth prevails. Men are not good for their words. Even the, the belief that I have to manipulate things and cut corners and, and get what I want to get by any means possible, cross my fingers while I sign a contract, or, or whatever it is that is shaping the untruths and dishonesty of our current culture. Because people do that, they assume that in others. And so they are not trustworthy, and they do not trust others. And, and this is a crisis of language, a crisis of integrity in the unbelieving culture around us. 
David felt that very thing. Imagine the contrast when the world government is Christ and the world culture is Jesus' culture. What will social media be like? What will the news reports be like? What will the history textbooks in elementary school be like? Truth, 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 and truth enforced, and truth enjoyed. The world culture will actually enjoy truth incarnate seated on his throne and ruling through truth and enforcing truth. It'll be wonderful. A worldwide society of truth, ruled by truth incarnate. And then can you imagine the eternal state when untruth will be absolutely impossible? No untruths will abide in heaven proper. The new heavens and the new earth will be populated only by people who cannot lie, just like God cannot lie. We will be like him totally, without any reservation, without any residue of our depravity, without an inkling of untruth, without the ability to speak untruth. It'll be wonderful. The third observation that David makes, this man troubled by corruption around him, is the comforting promise of God that comes from verse 5. I'm going to reverse the order so we feel the effect of this. I will arise, says Yahweh, because of the devastation of my afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy ones that belong to me. This is a direct quote from God in the psalm. We don't get this very often. All of a sudden, Yahweh is speaking in the first person. Most of the songs are songs about Yahweh or songs sung to Yahweh, and this one quotes Yahweh. We saw that in Psalm 2. We see that again here in Psalm 12. Yahweh is speaking. And what does Yahweh say? I will arise. He describes the powerful, oppressive deception that presses on the afflicted and the needy. God is aware that his own people are afflicted by violence. Uh, That is the word for devastation there in verse 5. They are groaning in their time of need. And God himself says, I will arise now. This word now, this time word, implies a season of waiting. If God says, I will arise now, it means there's a time coming when, when he will do this. And it will be now, whenever that is. But until then, God's people wait. This is the common experience of the godly in this life. To wait on the Lord, it is a lost art of faith. Waiting on God is the discipline of faith multiplied by time. I will trust God now, and I must trust Him in the next moment, and I must trust Him in the next moment and the next. Until my present circumstance is God's now, I will wait. And while I'm waiting, my circumstances remain unchanged. God will act, and I will wait for him to say, now I will arise. And when God simply speaks these words, our hearts are comforted. For God to speak in the first person in this psalm is such a comfort to us, we know that our suffering is known by him. He loves and he cares for his people. He has a good plan that he will execute in perfect time. Charles Spurgeon said of this verse, The mere oppression of the saints, however silently they bear it, is in itself a cry to God. Jesus feels with his people, and their smarts are mighty orators with him. That's great. Sometimes we we don't pray, and God hears the groanings of our hearts. Sometimes we don't know how to pray, and God fixes the prayers and interprets them according to his will. He hears the groans and sighs of his people. They speak loudly to his heart. Spurgeon went on to say that nothing moves a father like the cries of his children. There's a fourth observation in this psalm. And it is David's observation of the proven reliability of God. The proven reliability of God. Notice what he says in verse 6. The words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. David says this bibliological doxology, this praise of the word of God, right after God spoke in the first person. 
God said something, and then David responded, God's words are true. Verse 6 is the amen to verse 5. It is the affirmation of the reliability of God's promises. God just spoke. And you know, His words never fail. Let's sing together. We can trust Him. In contrast to the words of the corrupt culture around David, David says the words of Yahweh are pure words. They are true, reliable, holy, undefiled. The words of Yahweh are described here in this verse as pure words. They are words like silver refined in a furnace seven times. The silver ore would be put into the furnace and and the furnace would heat up the precious metal. Impurities would rise to the top and be removed. And to do that seven times would be the sort of the perfect way, the, the ultimate way to get all of the impurities out of silver so that what you were left was brilliant, bright, clean, pure, unalloyed, precious metal. Now God's word is not filled with impurities that need to be cooked out. God's word is compared to the kind of silver that has already been refined seven times. God's word is pure, unalloyed, just like that perfect precious metal. Of course, God's speech is a model for our own. We who would seek to be like him in his character ought to be like him in speech. You know in your own heart the difficulty of this. We feel our weakness. There's another weakness that we need to consider related to the purity of God's words. We might readily say amen, like verse 6 says in response to verse 5. We might say God promises, God's promises are true, I'm clinging to the promises. And it's easy to say when life is easy. But we can affirm it doctrinally and in our creeds and in our songs when all is well. The real test for our hearts about the word of God. The reliability of God, the the goodness of God in His words is seen when things are difficult. Do we equally express and affirm the quality of His words when He delays in a deliverance? Do we secretly find fault with God when His ways are not the path we would have chosen for ourselves? John Calvin said, most Christians affirm God's word is true, but few give Him this credit when under adversity. I think that's true of our hearts. A fifth observation comes for us in verse 7. It is the observation David makes about the enduring protection of the godly. Look at verse 7. You, O Yahweh, will keep them. You will guard him from this generation forever. In the first half of verse 7, David expresses his confidence of Yahweh's protection of his people collectively. It boils down to the individual level in the second half of the verse. You will guard him. And then from this generation, from now, from this crooked era that I'm finding myself in, this culture of corruption in my generation, you will protect me now and enduring into eternity. This is a confidence in God's prevailing, his prevailing care for his people, his prevailing integrity, his prevailing concern, and all of that evinced in a care that endures well past the presenting difficulty. In fact, infinitely beyond it. When the adversaries are long gone and long forgotten, God will extend his love as a banner over his people. You and I will remember forever God's covenant love with us when the memories of mistreatment lie in the distant past of a thousand lifetimes. Was I ever mistreated? I don't really remember that. All I know is that God loves me because we've been here 10,000 years. I have a photograph of a statue on my wall at home. Uh, The statue comes from Prague. In modern-day Czechoslovakia, it's a statue of John Huss. He was a Czech reformer before the Reformation. He was a Catholic priest for whom the Scriptures opened his eyes. The Holy Spirit caused him to be born again, and he loved the Bible. He loved the gospel, and he began to proclaim these things, and the church didn't like it. The church 
prohibited him preaching. The church officially excommunicated him, but then didn't enforce it for a while. And so he kept on preaching, preaching the word of God, preaching the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ's finished work alone, long before 1517 and Martin Luther. He was promised at one point safe passage to the Council of Constance in 1414. And he was lied to, betrayed, and imprisoned. And then he was killed July 6th, 1415. He was burned at the stake for what the church called heresy. His heresy was a belief in the gospel of faith in the finished work of Christ. And his heresy was a belief in the authority of the Bible. And to bring further spite, his ashes were later dug up and thrown into the Rhine River. The truth of John Huss's beliefs and his integrity of life were not vindicated until after his death. Tradition says that before being led to the funeral, before being led to the, the fire which marked his death, Huss said, Today they will roast a goose, but after a hundred years they will hear a swan sing. Keep in mind that John Huss's name means goose. So he was saying, you, my goose is cooked. I'm cooked. I'm done. But a swan will sing. Whether he actually said this or not is a, is a matter of uh, church history's record, uh, which can be flawed into mythology sometimes and exaggerated tales. But we don't know. Perhaps he actually said it. Luther quotes him as saying it. Of course, Luther came about a hundred years later. Luther is seen as the swan who sang, swan who sang the gospel. He used Huss's writings in his own writings. And after reading John Huss's work, Martin Luther himself was perplexed as to why such a great man as John Huss was killed. Luther would later go on to say that he... His own mentor, Johann von Staupitz, Augustine, and even Paul the Apostle were Hussites. That is the description of, of John Huss's testimony and Martin Luther's dependence on him uh, from a, a man named Leroy Demarest. It's remarkable that John Huss did not get vindicated in his own lifetime. And even after his martyrdom, he was so hated that his ashes were burned up and thrown or dug up and thrown into the river. The reality is, John Huss was protected by the Lord and endures to this day under the banner of God's love long after his adversaries have been forgotten, long after his enemies have gone to their own graves. That is the truth for all who are in Christ. No matter the culture of the world of unbelief around. No matter the disdain for truth in our present day. There's a sixth observation. A final observation in the psalm comes at verse 8. And it is the temporary persistence of the wicked. This is a bit of a surprise. We, we learned about a problem in the beginning of the psalm. And we've come to the theological solution. The turn as we've been calling it through the middle of the psalm. And then we end up back where we started in verse 8. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. <laughs> What's going on here? The psalm ends with the wicked still around. They walk about guilty, unopposed, proud, contemptuous. They are free now to oppose and oppress God's people. And they continue to do so in an era when vileness, what the psalmist calls worthless things, are exalted among the sons of men. The culture hasn't changed. This psalm didn't fix the presenting problem. This is such an interesting song. While the values of the world are not the values of our Lord, David has appropriated the values of the Lord into his own heart. And he's able to sing and exult. And still the psalm ends with the wicked strutting about. 
This is such an interesting psalm. It does not end at solution. The solution was in the middle. The eschatology was in verse 3 and in verse 7. The turn that we've been looking, learning to look for in the psalms was the whole middle. But in verse 8, the problem persists. And this is so helpful for us to see. Even when we're in the psalms where the turn changes the tone... The tune changes in the psalm because we come to some theological truth and then, okay, now we're fine. Even in all of those psalms, the truth is the circumstance didn't change for the songwriter. He's still writing the song. The enemies haven't gone away, but theology has prevailed, faith has prevailed, truth has won his heart, and he has confidence in God to sing and to lead the nation in singing. And the same thing's true of this psalm. This psalm is just a good example that reveals that the reality behind all those other psalms. The circumstance doesn't change. The tune in the song is faith confessed. It's built on theology, the truth, the reality of God. Confidence in God's glory, His character, His purpose. God's lock on the future. And yet the reality here is the wicked go on to strut about on every side. For all the while that worthlessness or vileness is exalted among the sons of men. You and I will walk out of this service this evening, Lord willing, having meditated on this psalm. Maybe you've thought about situations in your own life. Maybe you've thought about the culture around us, the culture of untruth. I can't trust anything I read, anything I hear, anything I see. And people don't even trust me because everybody's just used to lies. And you'll think, oh no, this psalm was all about the truth. I'm going to go out and the world will be different. No, the world will not be any different than what it was when you walked in. But I pray that our hearts are different. Resonating with the truth from the one who is the truth, who will settle the truth in the end. We wait on him and we trust him. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your words. Your words are wonderful. (laughs) Where else would we go? Uh, We certainly could not trust in man. Uh, We could not trust in ourselves. But we trust you implicitly. You are good and you do good. You cannot lie. And your words are from you. So we thank you. We thank you that your word is an anchor for us. A bedrock, a foundation, a pillar. Reliable. And we pray to be changed by it. Conformed ever more to your image. And we pray to be those who would bear the truth of your glorious gospel and your glorious return to a world that needs it. In Jesus' name, amen.